so this is um, to talk through the urban health reading packs that um, we've um, put together with the, the help of uh, different advisors. Um, so I've worked really closely on these with um, Dr. Siddharth Agarwal, who's based at the Urban Health Resource Centre in Delhi. And uh, Dr. Agarwal has a long history of experience on working on urban health, particularly in slum communities and uh, particularly around gender issues within slum communities. Um, so he has played a, played a very uh, strong role in pulling together these reading packs. Um, I work at the University of Leeds, where I'm a, a lecturer in public health, um, looking at uh, the and evaluating the impacts of public health it, um, interventions, particularly focused at the disadvantaged. Um, and within that, then looking particularly at the urban disadvantaged is a, is a key theme. Um, and we work on the DFID funded Comdis HSD um, research consortium and one of our themes is urban health so a lot of the data that's coming out of that research consortium is about the the issues with urban health services but also risks and um, urban health populations um, and the issues um, that they face so on that basis we have pulled together three reading packs. Um, the first one is really looks at the data and evidence that's available around urban health and urban equity issues. Um, the second one is about improving population health and looks broader at some of the wider social determinants of health um, and how uh, they impact um, on health and how they're specific to, to urban areas. So that's the, the reading pack B. Um, and the third one, reading pack C, looks at um, urban health services in particular um, and the challenges facing the delivery of health services within the urban environment. So um, I'll talk you through the, um, the slides. Um, so first of all, the world is definitely urbanizing and in 2007 uh, more of the world's population were urban than rural. 54% um, of the world's population um, by 2014 are living in urban areas. By 2050 that's expected to rise to 66% of the world's population um, and means that there will be an extra 2.5 billion people in the urban population. Um, this is much higher in um, low income countries than high income countries and 64% um, will are urbanites in Asia by 2050 and 56% in Africa by 2050. So um, much higher growth rates in um, low and middle income countries. And the, the second slide there um, which is data that comes from the WHO um, Global Report on Urban Health, which came out uh, in April or May this year, um, and really clearly shows that massive growth um, in the um, urban population in low and middle income countries. And another point just to make is often the focus is on mega cities, um, where as a mega city, you've got a population of 10 million or more. But actually, when you look at the proportion of the populations living in different cities, it's the medium sized cities that um, have the, the, the highest population of, of urbanites living within those. So these are and these are often ignored. It's very easy to focus on the big mega cities. But actually, these medium sized cities are really um, important to, to understand the kind of dynamics and the uh, health risks and health outcomes of populations in those cities. Um, so the, another slide here, drawing on data from um, the uh, uh, global, the, the recent UN Habitat WHO report, showing the average annual rate of change in the proportion of urban dwellers. So you can see that's a cre increasing across the board in different priority countries. Uh, Zimbabwe is uh, bucking the trend there, and I think that uh, may be due to to political reasons um, but apart from that you can see a very high percentage average annual rate of change of urban growth across those priority countries. The key point here is that um, there is a bit of a myth about the urban advantage and when we start to unpick what's going on for that um, 
and understanding what's happening to populations within urban areas, the proportion of the population living in slum conditions um, is really high and growing. So 863 million uh, people living in slum conditions. Um, just thinking about the definition of a slum, so you and Habitat have a definition that is widely used um, and uh, this this is very broad in terms of any area that has one or more of the following characteristics. So inadequate access to water, um, inadequate access to sanitation, other infrastructure, um, poor structural quality of housing, overcrowding and insecure residential status. Um, so that's a very broad definition. And I think sometimes when we talk about slum, we think of that being um, informal settlements. And I think that definition lets us see that actually people living in maybe crammed into one room in very poor living conditions that also fits definitely within this definition of a slum um, so that I think we need to take that into consideration um, another term that um, is important is this concept of peripherization um, which is the kind of urban sprawl that can happen around cities particularly around kind of illegal um, settlements informal settlements coming up on the, the edges of cities um, and a key point around this is the, the data that we're using to understand inequalities in urban areas. So a lot of that data comes from big surveys like the Demographic and Health Survey um, or other, other large surveys like STEPS or MIX. Um, and when you look through the published evidence using these surveys, often it presents the rural urban comparison and it looks like urban areas are doing a lot better in terms of health outcomes. But when you scratch a little bit away at what's going on with those surveys, um, it's quite clear that there are a um, there's a real missing urban poor population that does not make it into those surveys. So, for example, this slide here, on um, which is taken from the World Pop um, website. So World Pop is run out of the University of Southampton, and they're using satellite imagery as well as census data to... Um, understand the densities of populations. So this particular picture shows Kathmandu and the white line is the administrative boundary which would be used within the census. Um, so for most big surveys that's used as a sampling frame. So you can see in that picture that there's big splurges of dark colour all around the edge that shows very dense populations. So you can see those are not within those white administrative boundaries. So those that peripherization um, is not being captured in, in, in those surveys. So when we're talking about the urban population we are missing many many of the urban poor. Um, the, the next couple of slides really look at um, within urban areas and how trying to use something like DHS to understand inequities within urban areas. Um, it, it's not, in a way, it's not appropriate to do that. Those surveys are set up to be nationally representative. But I think when you, when you try to look at the proportion of households from the sample that fall within the different quintiles, it's very obvious. So for example, this one, this first slide is about uh, um, the DHS Nepal 2011. So only 168 households ended up in the poorest wealth, were from the poorest wealth quintile where um, 1,697 were in the richest. So you can see that that data is then going to be very skewed to what's going on in terms of risk factors and health outcomes for the, the richest. Um, similarly for the Bangladesh, the next slide is about the Bangladesh DHS. Um, which shows that the same the same issue, real underrepresentation of the poorest. Um, so these issues are, are discussed in um, Reading Pack A, along with um, a look at some of the key kind of health issues um, in urban areas. Um, so. The next slide, now despite everything I've just said about the DHS data, this is actually um, one of the only ways of, of looking at some of these issues. So for example, the WHO UN Habitat Global Urban Health Report that's just come out 
has done this within urban analysis, um, looking at different wealth quintiles for various issues. So um, these two graphs here are on under five chronic malnutrition and women's obesity. Um, and the orange line there is the urban poorest quintile. And you can see for under five child mal um, malnutrition that actually in for the poorest in urban areas, this is this is um, in particularly in South Asia, this is highest um, higher for the urban poorest than it is for rural areas. Um, so that's that's a, a very important issue. Um, there's a lot of focus on cardiovascular disease and diabetes, um, particularly in in South Asia, but increasingly um, across um, Sub-Saharan Africa as well. Um, and I think the data is showing that that um, this is higher in the in the urban poor than say rural areas, um, but as yet it's the uh, the, the wealthier. Um, urban population where this is a particular problem. But all the indication from kind of smaller data sets is that, um, particularly examples from India, that things like hypertension, um, cardiovascular disease, um, diabetes are getting more and more prominent in slum communities. Um, water and sanitation is a, a huge issue in um, urban areas and um, provision is, is really inadequate in urban slums. Uh, so the, the provision of drinking water on the premises, the provision of um, latrines, the disposal of um, waste from latrines, um, all of these issues are, are really important in, in slum areas. And you can see there that uh, provision of drinking water on the premises for many urban areas is um, the same or, or, or um, worse than in rural areas. Um, an interesting, really, I think a really interesting issue that has not maybe had enough attention is around tobacco. Um, and this uh, graph here, again, from the uh, Global Urban Health Report, um, showing very, very high levels of tobacco use amongst urban poor men. Um, and I think this is a real indication of the uh, sort of move by tobacco industry to, to find new markets for their products and really... Um, increasing the, the, the uptake of smoking amongst urban poor men and a lot of work there to change social norms um, is needed. So the next, uh, that was really um, information from PAC A. Um, PAC B and C really look at um, population health and services. So combining some of the, uh, the examples from all of those areas then, um, the, the first point to make is the uh, importance of looking at the wider social determinants when we talk about urbanization um, and how all these issues interlink to have a, a big impact on health and when we're talking about then the response to that the role of municipalities and local government is absolutely key um, so we're talking about looking at access to services and markets, housing, water and sanitation, um, healthy places, trying to, to come up with healthy places, um, which links very closely to transport and communications. So all of those issues are absolutely key. And the role of local government in leading the response to that um, can't be underestimated. However, over um, the... the the course of time, those municipalities have been um, consistently sort of underfunded, under supported, with a lot of support going instead to the big ministries, Ministry for Health, Ministry of Education. So um, often those local governments are, are really struggling with capacity. Um, they don't have, we've talked about some of the constraints of, of looking at within urban um, data. So often they don't have the data they need. To, to plan the services and decide where to locate their health centres or where to um, deliver health promotion activities, which, which populations to target on. So they don't have the data, they don't have the capacity um, to be able to really use that to, to make decisions and continually sort of being underfunded and under supported. And there are examples of uh, donors working with local government and some of those appear in, particularly in PAC B, um, and particularly the, the, the programme in uh, Kolkata, the CUSP programme um, is discussed in that PAC. Um, one thing that has, is uh, very clear in a lot of urban areas is how, with the focus on rural health, this is meant in many countries there's often quite a good structure of 
uh, primary care, maybe with sort of health posts or community clinics and then primary health care centres and then district hospitals and quite a well-established um, government health system. You get to the urban area and there is a real limitation in terms of public health facilities um, that are free and of good quality for, that are appropriate for the urban poor. Um, and there's a lot of work to show that these are very inadequate and that when you're working with the private sector, um, there are real issues in terms of the training of private providers, that many of them haven't actually been through formal medical training of any nature. Um, and I think these issues really come out in examples of um, the urban poor being very vulnerable to exploitation. So having unnecessary um, screening, paying over the odds for, for services, and really not having the access to quality services. And this issue is, is particularly um, influenced by the lack of coordination between Ministry of Health and municipalities. So in many countries, the responsibilities for urban health kind of fall between the two. So um, municipalities might have the um, overall responsibility for funding those urban health centres, those public urban health centres, but the Ministry of Health might be responsible for training staff or the provision of drugs. So they've really got to coordinate and link up. And in reality, these things are are just not happening, um, leading to a very underfunded and inadequate um, public primary care service in urban areas. Um, the, so that means the poor are basically going to private facilities or going to large tertiary hospitals for things that could be dealt with in primary care, meaning that those tertiary centres are really overloaded not only with the urban population but also the rural population coming in under um, to, to get specialist uh, uh, issues addressed um, or the, the uh, perception that the quality there is somehow better so um, this leads to this real distortion in terms of the demand and supply of, of health services within urban areas um, there's lots of discussion about public-private partnerships, particularly in um, the third reading pack, um, and examples of, of trying to make this work. The uh, Urban Primary Healthcare Programme in Bangladesh is, is an example of that, um, where the government has in, um, linked up private care with kind of NGO clinics, um, and the public government health centres um, attempting to coordinate care um, and, and increase provision of quality care. But there are still real challenges in terms of uh, monitoring, enforcing quality across the board, issues about referral through different levels of care when you've got very different providers. Um, and obviously we're talking about data before, so um, thinking about you've got all those different providers, how do you I mean, a, a very rich source of data is um, the uh, health clinic reports and that kind of routine data from health centres. But how do you access that when it's you've got this mixture of, of public and uh, private and NGO facilities all using different systems? So very difficult to get any data about health issues at, at that level as well. Um, so a lot of issues in terms of trying to make those public-private partnerships work. Um, so they're, they're covered in some, some detail in, in the packs. Um, I think all the indications around the move to the increasing kind of impact of non-communicable diseases, and I guess within that term, non-communicable diseases, obviously the focus is often on cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, stroke, um, which is clearly there and clearly we've seen that is growing um, and the risk factors for those are growing too. So the, the changes in diet, the dietary transition of people moving to urban areas, less access to fresh fruit and vegetable, uh, more street food. Um, so changes in diet, very important. We've seen the changes in tobacco use. So all of those issues that um, really highlight the need for more health promotion. I think the other element of NCDs that might sometimes get overlooked is that that 
certainly when WHO put that definition in, it includes um, mental health, it includes accidents and injuries, um, and that those are often the, the sort of forgotten NCDs, um, but particularly looking in slums, big issues around accidents and injuries, particularly amongst the under 10s, um, and um, the, the kind of safety of that environment is, is really key. Mental health, a major issue in slums and certainly data from uh, India showing sort of levels of sort of 20, 23% in, in slums of depress, depression and anxiety. So increasingly there's more evidence and information coming out about that, these really important issues and often driven by um, the kind of stresses of living in the urban area. So particularly in slum areas, the threat of eviction, the threat of flooding, urban slums often built in areas that are prone to flooding. They're the land that nobody else wants to live on, so they're prone to flooding and various other kind of environmental shocks. So all of that leading to more stress and, and resulting in impacts on things like mental health. Um, so health promotion to try to prevent some of these issues and we've seen the limitations of the health services within um, urban areas so to try to stop people getting to that point where they need health services is really key um, and yet there are a few kind of large scale um, programs and evaluations of those programs around health promotion um, there is evidence that um, mass media can work particularly well in urban areas with people having access, more access to mobile phones, to um, print, radio, TV. Um, so it can have a big impact. Um, and there are examples of that in PAC B, looking at, at some of those impacts which seem to be higher in urban areas than rural areas. So that's clearly, there's something there about trying to use those new techniques to, to really push the health promotion um, agenda. Um, just thinking then about the kind of wider social determinants, and I think we have to emphasize the issues around housing, um, about slum slum upgrading um, and particularly rights to property and these are discussed um, in Pact B in some, in some detail um, and where there are examples where um, there have been moves to improve rights to property and particularly for women and how that can really have an impact. It means that people suddenly have a, an interest in maintaining and, and improving where they live. So immediately structures and renovations happen and it can make a really big difference to the, the environment that people are living in. Um, the evidence around slum upgrading, so there is a systematic review that we, we mention in, in Pact B. Um, that has uh, looked at the kind of health impacts of slum upgrading um, and found impacts in terms of particularly reducing um, diarrhea and gastrointestinal disease, um, but kind of limitations in the evidence base in terms of actually linking that to other improvements. Um, there are examples where slum upgrading has gone very wrong. And in Pac B, there's an example from South Africa of uh, slums being cleared and people being relocated outside the city. Um, but because um, perhaps a more directive approach was taken, not very participatory, so people ended up being really too far from their employment. So that the idea of living where you have to travel a long way to work was just enough to put people off, so came back to the informal settlements where they'd been living. So really emphasizing the need for participatory uh, processes to involve and engage people in thinking about slum upgrading. Um, WASH is, is of massive importance and comes up throughout the PACs. Um, in particular, there is a discussion around there's the approach community-led total sanitation, which seems to have um, had some positive effects in reducing gastrointestinal um, disease. Not much evidence from urban areas, but interesting concepts of actually kind of twisting that so it's more about rather than community-led total sanitation, it's about citizen-led, and it's much more about the advocacy role that um, communities can play in terms of uh, demanding better services from, um, from their 
local authorities. So some interesting work there and a real role for NGOs in making that happen. Um, and there are some very nice examples from um, Siddhar's work in, um, in India, working very closely with women's groups in slum areas so that they can, facilitating them to do kind of participatory mapping um, of their communities and identifying indicators that are important to them. Um, and obviously a lot of those around things like sewage systems, toilets, um, but also things around housing and access to health services. Um, and the process that he describes in the pack is about taking, um, helping women through this sort of facilitation process with the women's group to, okay, do that analysis, but then really um, looking at supporting them to then advocate for change and uh, some nice examples of petitions put together by those women and uh, then the response of the civic authorities actually to address some of those issues and using very sort of gentle negotiation tactics to, to make that happen. Um, so some real success in, in that approach. Um, uh, the, the idea of looking at place and the impacts of, of, of the actual environment around you on, on health is really key when we're talking about urbanisation. So there's a lot of evidence from high income contexts that access to green space um, has a very positive impact on health and has actually been uh, there is a strong association with reduction in health inequalities particularly around cardiovascular disease and actually it's been shown to be associated with um, reductions in all-cause mortality so we know access to green space is a good thing this is often um, really at the low a low priority in terms of urban planning but could actually have a have a really big impact and is something to consider in urban planning part of this is is there's a quite a big move around urban agriculture which is uh, mentioned in pack c um, and um, ways of helping communities to be able to grow food that is accessible and they can then sell in markets easily but also to improve nutrition and really key when we're talking about prevention and particularly around the cardiovascular disease um, issues so um, but also that has a kind of flip side in the urban area that often the land can be polluted and that can lead to, to pathogens entering the food chain so these things need to be regulated so there are there are issues but um, this is something that is is something that to could be addressed within urban planning. Um, and just to highlight another issue that is raised in PAC uh, B and also in PAC C around the changing role of women in, in urban areas. And in, uh, for example, in Bangladesh, they've done a specific urban household survey um, to address this problem of not having data on urban inequalities. And something that's come out of that very clearly is that slum women are much more likely to work full time outside of the home. So 33% of slum women compared to about 17% in non-slum working full time outside of the home. Um, so while this is in many ways brilliant for, for women's um, empowerment and access to resources, um, there are then sort of impacts in terms of particularly around childcare and being able to supervise children. And certainly um, our research is showing high levels of accidents and injuries. And we've been looking in, in, uh, in Mirpur, in one of the slums in Dhaka. Um, and limited supervision of, of children you don't have the extended family network that you might have in rural areas to support with childcare. Um, so that these these are real challenges. Um, in PAC C we've got details of some some nice uh, interventions to to address this both from India and also from from Kenya where there's a nice example of um, in the Nairobi slums of the Kidogo social enterprise networks where they have a kind of hub and spoke model of a kind of early childhood development center and then um, women running as a, a kind of small income generating project having a um, like a crash like a crash in a box so all the things you'd need for childcare in a box so they can then take that home and look after a couple of children in their own homes um, and earn a little bit of income through that so there are some interesting models that 
um, can support these issues of, of, of childcare, early childhood development and, and protection and safety for those children while their, their mums are working. Um, there are also some examples in the packs of um, how cities can, you can bring together different stakeholders across cities to address kind of key issues for example, the um, legislation around smoke-free cities. So there's a link there to a nice resource from WHO um, on how it, it details a, a process of how you can run workshops with multi-sectoral um, stakeholders to, to look at how you can come up with a smoke-free city. Um, so progress needed to, as I mean, we talked about this sort of rising rates of tobacco use, but actually changing the social norms. So having kind of smoke-free cities can be a really positive intervention. Transport and communications is absolutely key in urban areas. Um, all the kind of key negative externalities generated by transport, um, pollution, road accidents, um, and the displacement of slum communities with the big project development of building roads. Um, there is a real social gradient in terms of the impacts of those on, on communities. Um, there are some nice examples, again, in, in PAXI of interventions where um, through legislation, so for example, in Kenya, the legislation of the Matatu drivers um, to, uh, to increase their their driving skills and safety skills, um, and that program actually led to a 73% reduction in accidents. Um, so these things can work, um, but there's also a lot of evidence around um, where cities are more compact and people can um, walk, cycle, use public transport, that actually those health benefits, the reductions in pollution um, are, are absolutely key. Um, and um, to, to summarise then this, this final slide then just kind of pulls it all together to, to show that this is really this there's work to be done on both the supply side and, and the, the demand side. So urban disadvantaged communities really being supported and facilitated to, to advocate for the services that they need um, and how challenging that can be with urban slum communities who are often transient, they're moving from one slum to another. You don't have those sort of strong networks that you might have in a rural area. Um, so really facilitating that, supporting NGOs that are working at that community level to, to build that strength and that advocacy to, to demand better services is absolutely key. But then this focus as well on municipalities and the kind of support um, that they need to take this wider intersectoral approach. And um, so in the, in the reading packs, you'll see all of these issues and more covered. And we've tried to point you to, uh, to key resources in those areas that, that could, uh, could help in, in understanding these issues better.